Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the HPL seminar this week. Today, it is my pure pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Nick Knowles. Nick did his, his undergrad at Curtin University in Ottawa and received a Bachelor's of Engineering degree in 2013. Then he started his master's at the University of Western Ontario in mechanical engineering under the supervision of Dr. Luis Ferreira. His research was specialized in the field of musculoskeletal health, which was specifically about osteoarthritis related to the morphology of glenoid in, in shoulder and bone quality. After he achieved his master's degree in 2015, he continued his research at the same university. Um, during his PhD, he worked on how to improve material mapping in glenohumeral finite element models and achieved his PhD degree in 2019. After he graduated, he further built his career by working as a postdoctoral associate at the University of Western Ontario in orthopedic surgery under the supervision of Dr. George Atwell and also worked as a micro CT imaging technician in the Department of Anthropology. He's been now uh, working with a postdoc with uh, Dr. Steve Boyd's group and his current research interests include non-invasive bone mechanics and quantitative image analysis. When I asked him about one scientific accomplishments that he is most proud of, he said that is um, he said that it is receiving the CIHR Benting Postdoctoral Fellowship, which I know that this is very highly competitive and prestigious as well. When he is not busy, he also enjoys outdoor activities, including running, road and mountain biking, hiking, and snowboarding. He also mentioned an interesting fact about himself that the first person who introduced him to finite element analysis is actually Dr. Ifas Hader, who was the moderator of the HPL seminar last year. Well done, Ifas. Today, Nick will be giving a talk entitled as Digital Volume Correlation in Bone Research. Nick, whenever you are ready. Great, thank you so much for that great introduction. <clears throat> so hopefully I'll do Ifa's justice here and discuss some of what, it, what he taught me in finite element analysis. <laughs> so when we're looking at uh, imaging of bone, here I've shown uh, two examples, one being micro CT along the top. And what we see here is that we get really high spatial resolutions, which are able to maintain that bone architecture. And on the top right, we see uh, an axial cross section through a glenoid, and we can see that nice trabecular architecture and cortical shell. If we look at something like clinical CT, which is on the bottom, we end up with what's more of a blurred image. So this is the same glenoid through an axial slice. And basically our bone architecture here uh, is represented as an apparent density or our bone uh, uh, density is represented as an apparent density. If we scan, uh, a specimen or a patient with uh, a phantom, then we can, we term this quantitative computed uh, tomography or QCT imaging of bone. Here we have uh, a cadaveric shoulder, which has been scanned in a clinical CT scanner with a calibration phantom. And here we know the density of these rods in this, uh, in this phantom. And we can relate the Hounsfield units in our image to the rod, to the density in the rods, and then come up with uh, volumetric, volumetric bone mineral density uh, measurements. You can also use phantom lifts measurements, which are becoming more popular uh, in the modeling of bone now to use clinical CT scans. If we look at microarchitectural parameters of bone, so if we are able to maintain that nice architecture with high resolution imaging, uh, there are a lot of different parameters that are discussed in the literature. These are a few of the ones that I'll be discussing today. Uh, bone volume fraction represents uh, the sample uh, that we've taken, in this case, a cubic uh, core, or sorry, a core um, from trabecular bone uh, in, uh, in the glenoid. Uh, 
the bone volume itself represents the bone and then total volume represents the area of the cylinder in this case. So that would be our bone volume fraction. Trabecular uh, thickness represents the mean uh, thickness of the trabeculae throughout uh, the sample that we're looking at. And uh, trabecular separation represents uh, the spaces in between the trabeculae. Looking at apparent level bone parameters, kind of show a workflow here on the law on the top, which starts with that high resolution. And then you can see essentially down sampled image is what our clinical image looks like. If we end up using QCT imaging, we have something, we have that relationship, which gives us a radiological density or often we call it a QCT density. Uh, probably more historically what's used is, is an apparent density or an ash density. So an apparent density, we would take the bone mass, the hydrated bone mass, we would weigh that and then use that same total volume in order to determine apparent density or ash mass, we would uh, burn the, the bone sample in a furnace and measure the uh, mass of the ash. These all, all of these parameters can be related and there are multiple studies in the literature uh, that relate uh, radiological density, apparent density and ash density. If we're looking at apparent level mechanical properties, here I'm going to go through a workflow of how to calculate uh, an apparent modulus. So if we're looking at a cubic specimen uh, here or a rectangular specimen as we are here, the apparent area would be the top of our cube and the apparent length would be the length of that cube. We can use that to determine uh, an apparent stress if a force is applied. So here we would generally apply some, some amount of unconstrained compression to determine uh, an apparent strain. In this case, either computationally or uh, physically uh, using experiments, measure the reaction force and then use that in order to calculate our apparent stress. And then we can relate that to our apparent strain in order to calculate an apparent modulus. And this is important because it allows us to relate our apparent modulus to our apparent density. So although we don't have micro, micro architectural parameters in our clinical CT scans, we do have our apparent density, which can then be related to our radiological density. So what we often use when we're deriving finite element models uh, using clinical CT scans is something called a density modulus relationship. So here on the uh, y-axis, we have that term apparent modulus. On the x-axis, we have our apparent density. And this, this is a review article from more than 10 years ago now, but what it shows is that historically most of the equations that are used uh, in the literature have a lot of variation. And there's actually been a lot of uh, research even in the 10 years past that have uh, looked at these density modulus relationships and their effect on uh, the accuracy of different finite element models. And here I just show a figure of historically how these would be experimentally measured instead of uh, using a computational microfinite element model. So as I mentioned, we use these often to derive image-based finite element models. So if we look at the images on the left first would be a QCT-based finite element model. So these are generally meshed with tetrahedral elements, elements which are connected to each other uh, by nodes. In relating the uh, image back to our finite element model, we use this density modulus relationship. If we're looking at a micro CT based finite element model, well, we retain that nice trabecular architecture. Should generally what we do is we uh, create a binary image, uh, which is thresholded to just uh, keep the bone tissue. We then generally assume that the bone tissue is all homogeneous material. So all of the modulus of, at the tissue level is the same. Uh, we can generally mesh these with what we call a smooth mesh. Um, but probably what's more common in uh, micro-based finite element models are what we call voxel-based models, which use li li linear hexahedral elements. These have been shown to be quite accurate and uh, very computationally efficient. But the challenge when we use any finite element models is always validating our finite element model. So there are a few examples of, of how these have been done. Pro historically, what's most common is probably strain gauges uh, placed on the outer cortical shell as shown here. This would be loaded in a mechanical testing frame and then a finite element model would be generated that matches the boundary conditions of that experimental setup. 
you would then measure the strains in your finite element model so they match your cortical uh, locations of your strain gauges in your experiment. Uh, in the past probably 10 years, what has become more common is digital image correlation. So this requires a speckle pattern to be placed on the specimen or some kind of uh, heterogeneous uh, distribution that can be tracked with uh, software. Again, the finite element model is generated uh, to match the experimental loading conditions. But the limitation of this is that we're unable to experimentally capture internal load transfer within the trabecular bone. And we always have to assume idealized loading conditions in order to replicate our experimental setup in our, excuse me, in our finite element model. So we begin to think of how can we validate our models and how can we replicate some of these boundary conditions. And at the time, my supervisor, uh, Dr. Ferreira, had been working with these um, hexa hexapod loading robots. And we ended up buying one that had been modified with uh, radiolucent carbon fiber struts here. So we can place uh, a specimen in this uh, center region. It allows for six degree of freedom range of motion. And it also allows for six degree of freedom load measurement and can be customized in multiple different ways, depending on what we're trying to simulate. And this is really what drove our DVC research from this point on. <clears throat> the method that we first chose to use for uh, digital volume correlation in, in uh, validating our models is known as global digital volume correlation. And the, the software that we use is known as Bone DVC. So this was developed at the University of Sheffield. So if we look at the workflow flow from left to right here, we have a micro CT scanner. So the source in this case is fixed in the, um, uh, the detector is fixed on the other side. We place our hexapod loading robot and here we have a cadaveric uh, scapulae. We apply a load with the hexapod robot. Uh, we first take a scan with no load. We then take a scan with a load. This gives us two image stacks, those being undeformed and then deformed. And then we're essentially looking at our displacement vectors in the X, Y, and Z direction between the image stacks. What's nice about this, if you remember back to our image-based finite element models, is with the global DVC approach, we basically end up with a voxelized model, which can be directly related to our finite element models. And these are full fields. So we're able to actually look at the displacements and then we can solve these in order to determine the strains throughout the entire structure. So this can be used as a comparison method, but it can also be used to assign more accurate boundary conditions. And that's really what the first study, uh, or one of the first studies that we did um, with DVC it was to validate our, our QCT finite element model. So this was uh, led by Jonathan Cousins, who's a PhD student who shorted, started shortly after me. And as I mentioned, the DVC software was uh, developed at the University of Sheffield by Enrico Delara. So he was a collaborator on this project and, and really drove these studies from the start. So as I mentioned, we have uh, a fixed source here. Our hexapod robot will load our, um, our specimen, start with our unloaded image stack, apply a load, take another image. And this gives us uh, a full field displacement map uh, as shown here under our 500 Newton load. So this was repeated, I think, in this study for four specimens. We also, the nice thing with the hexapod robot is we could do off axis. So in this case, we applied an off axis load. Uh, obviously we get a different full field displacement map. And then we're looking at modeling the boundary conditions in a QCT uh, model. So our experimental setup is shown here on the left. These um, QCT models were derived from QCT scans, so clinical QCT scans of the same specimens. And the first loading condition we wanted to look at was what we call idealized force. So this would generally be how we would set up the boundary conditions if we um, didn't have DVC. So we have our specimen is potted in PMMA bone cement. So we, we fix that on our bottom surface of our specimen. Here we've modeled the, uh, the hemispherical loading platen. We look at contact between that and uh, the scapula. Similarly, 
Here, instead of applying a force that we measure with our load cell, we're applying a displacement. So we can measure our displacements with our hexapod robot. And then finally, and probably the most important with the DVC method is that we actually know what our DVC displacement field is because we've measured that with our experimental setup. So in this case, what we're doing is driving the nodes on the medial surface and the lateral surface in order to match our experiment. And then what we can do is look at the displacements that occur inside the bone and compare that back to our DVC experimental measure to see how well our QCT finite element model uh, matches our experimental condition. What we're looking at here are the results from one of our specimens under just that compressive load. And what I've shown on the top are the color maps that represent just the Z direction loading. So everything is compressive here. So I'm just showing Z direction. What we have on the far left here is our experimental displacement field. Uh, and then we can see our FEA predictions for the three different boundary conditions, idealized force, idealized displacement, and DVC driven. So we can see qualitatively that our DVC driven boundary conditions uh, best replicate that experimental displacement field. And that was true if we look at the linear regression relationships as well. So on the left here is slope with one, an, one being kind of our ideal slope or excellent agreement. And for all four specimens represented by the different cover or different color, sorry, we can see that only for our DVC driven boundary condition uh, did we achieve that, that slope of one. Similarly, if we're looking at our correlation coefficient, uh, we have idealized force boundary condition, idealized displacement boundary condition, and, um, and uh, DVC driven boundary condition. We can see that our R square valued of one uh, is best uh, represented by our DVC driven boundary conditions. Very similarly, if we look at our, our off axis load, so this was 500 Newtons off axis, we have our experimental displacement field here, which is best represented again by our DVC uh, driven boundary conditions. And here, if we look at our, our slope and correlation coefficient with our three different boundary conditions, our DVC driven boundary conditions uh, best represent the slope and best represent the, the correlation coefficient um, for all of our specimens. So what we concluded from this story or from this study, sorry, were that local experimental displacements can be predicted by subject specific finite element models if the boundary conditions are replicated correctly. Using a very similar data set, I think I added two more specimens in this study. I wanted to look more at uh, the effect of material mapping parameters. So the workflow is the same. We loaded uh, cadaveric scapulae within the micro CT scanner, our pre and post loaded scan. In this case, only a, only a, a compressive scan, not off axis. Again, used bone DVC in order to determine our full field displacement map. As far as the QCT based finite element generation, as I mentioned, six cadaveric specimens in this case, they were meshed with uh, quadratic TET elements. I wanted to look at elemental material mapping or nodal material mapping. So these are just different ways of representing that apparent modulus within our model. And then I use DVC driven boundary conditions. And the, the primary outcome variable for me were the predictive reaction forces. So could I determine with these different material mapping strategies, the reaction forces that we are measuring experimentally with our load cell. As far as density modulus material mapping went, there are a bunch of different equations that exist in the literature. So I looked at five of the most common in glenohumeral finite element models. And these were generally based in the trabecular bone. So here, what, I'm, what I did was look at different transitions between trabecular bone and cortical bone. In the cortical bone, there aren't as many different equations. So I only applied one overall, all five equations. So this was the first set of density modulus relationships. Here, we're looking at uh, a cortical um, density modulus relationship that is uh, fixed at uh, the average density of cortical bone. So in the lower range, we just have the trabecular mapping. And then finally, the next set of density modulus relationships is just looking at the same equation that was der derived typically for trabecular bone over the full density range. What we have as our outcome here is percentage error in experimental versus QCT 
uh, FEM reaction force. And this is plotted uh, on the y-axis with our density modulus relationship on the x-axis and our six specimens represented by the different colors with our elemental material mapping on the left and nodal material mapping on the right. We can see is that there isn't much variation between the elemental material mapping or the nodal. What we found were that regardless, the errors for both elemental and nodal material mapping were very large. They ranged from almost negative 60% to almost 1000% with the best relationships differing in elemental or material uh, or nodal material mapping strategies. And really what this told us was that elemental material mapping improves the QCT finite element predicted reaction forces, especially when we use those DVC driven boundary conditions, but there's still relatively large errors observed using published density modulus relationships. And this is probably because we don't actually account for any of that uh, trabecular architecture that is occurring throughout the structure. Uh, John and I wanted to combine those two studies that we did because we were really curious, could our QCT find element models predict the strain map? And this is probably what we actually care about because if we're loading uh, to failure, then we can hopefully predict when fracture is going to occur. So John published this just this past year, again, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Delara, And we're doing the same workflow, except using our displacement field here, we've derived now our strain field and we can compare that in different regions in the specimens. So very similar setup. Here we're looking at uh, our QCT scans as our input. Here we only wanted to look at three different density modulus relationships. We were curious how those would change uh, the strain distribution. Again, elemental nodal material mapping. Two different boundary conditions. We thought boundary conditions would, would also affect our strain distributions. So we looked at our DVC driven boundary conditions. And here we, we basically call this one a hybrid, although here we call it contact force boundary condition because we're driving our DVC displacements on this, um, uh, on this surface here while we're using our force from our load cell in contact while modeling this hemispherical uh, loading platen. And that allows us to look at our streams, both uh, predicted in our QCT finite element models as well as our experimental. What we're looking at here are our contact force versus our DVC driven boundary conditions. On the left, we have our three different specimens. Then we have color maps, which represent our experimental load condition, our contact force in our QCT finite element models, and our DVC driven in our QCT finite element models. So we can see that for the most part, uh, qualitatively, our, our DVC driven boundary conditions, again, better replicate that, um, that strain field, but it, it's not overly clear if it's um, more effective here. Similarly, if we're looking at the relationship of density modulus uh, equation on our QCT finite element predicted strains, on the top, we have our contact force boundary conditions. On the bottom, our DVC driven boundary conditions, our experimental color map, and then our different equations. We can see with our DVC driven boundary conditions, there's almost no variation by the density modulus equation that we chose, but we can see there definitely is some variation if we choose contact force. Uh, boundary conditions. If we look at more quantitative results here, what we have is linear regression pooled uh, for our specimens. So along the x-axis of these three plots, we'll have our experimental third principle strain. So these essentially be our compressive strains. And then uh, on the y-axis, we have the predicted strains. So these would be from our finite element models. And we have our three different equations. And we can see that generally our regression uh, was improved as far as the R squared value goes when we're using our DVC, boundary, DVC driven boundary conditions, which are shown in black as opposed to gray being our applied force boundary conditions. So this again shows that when we're looking at strain instead of displacement, our DVC driven boundary conditions have better agreement. And that's really what we conclude from this. So fair agreement we found could be uh, could occur between full field experimental and our QCT finite element predicted strains. If we use our DVC boundary conditions and QCT finite element models using contact force boundary conditions seem to be influenced by the density modulus relationship. But interestingly, those with DVC driven boundary conditions were not. So until this point, most of what we've done were with uh, what we call normal cadaveric specimens. So they didn't have any pathology. And 
I really started to wonder what happens if we're looking at something like pathologic bone and how can we actually apply this TVC technique. If we're looking at something like total shoulder arthroplasty here or humeral head replacement, uh, to, historically what's been done is uh, a stemmed humeral component is placed. So here uh, we have a stemmed humeral component and a glenoid component on this side of the scapula. But what's becoming more popular are what we call stemless humeral components. So these no longer have a stem that goes down uh, the shaft of the, hu the humerus. And this also relies on the cortical shell as well as the underlying trabecular bone to support the implant. So it's very important that we understand what the mechanical properties are of the bone that underlie these implants. When we're looking at preparing either uh, a stemmed component or a short stem component, the humeral head has to be excised. So here the humeral head is cut off by the surgeon during surgery and the implant is placed. So probably in the last year of my uh, PhD, I started attending the surgeries of our clinical supervisor, uh, Dr. Athwal. And Dr. Athwal is an upper extremity surgeon and performs multiple total shoulder arthroplasty surgeries a year. So I started to collect the osteoarthritic patient humeral heads from patients that were undergoing total shoulder arthroplasty. Normally this bone would just be discarded with medical waste, but we were able to take it to the lab uh, and test it. And here what we used were cadaveric, uh, non-pathologic humeral heads as our controls. And in the first study, all I did with these was scan them in the micro CT scanner. So there's an example of that shown above to get these high resolution images. The initial workflow for this from left to right, we ended up with 28 uh, end stage OA humeral heads. They were all scanned in the micro CT at uh, 20 micrometers. Here I wanted to look at typically just a small region that was occurring uh, from the subchondral bone down into the humeral head. There are two kind of directions here that if we follow the top, uh, I generated microfinite element models, constrain these the same way that I showed how we essentially determine that apparent modulus relationship before. And this was so that I could determine an apparent modulus morphometric relationship. This is important uh, to determine the mechanical properties of, of these bones. I also wanted to look at the morphology of the bone. So here I looked at bone volume fraction, trabecular thickness, and trabecular separation in four different regions from medial to lateral. So from the subchondral trabecular bone down further into the core. If we look at bone volume fraction by depth first, what we see on the x-axis here are four different regions and y-axis is our bone volume fraction. There was a significant difference in our bone volume fraction only in that region one and then by the time we had reached region four, it was almost identical between black being normal and, and gray being OA. Similarly, if we look at trabecular thickness by depth with our four regions again, and then black being normal and gray being OA, we had a significant difference in trabecular thickness only in that first region. And again, by the time we've reached region four, uh, both our normal and OA cohorts were almost exactly the same. Here we didn't actually reach significance in region one, but still had a, a notable difference between our OA and normal in tra mean trabecular separation and almost identical again by the time we've reached region four. In order to determine the apparent mechanical properties, uh, I used the uh, microfine element models at uh, 20 micrometer voxel size applied uncom unconstrained compression. And here the outcome variable uh, is our apparent modulus. What we have here is a plot, uh, essentially a density modulus plot, but on the x-axis on the bottom, what we have is bone volume fraction. Uh, this can be related to our apparent density. So exactly the same as those uh, density modulus relationships we looked at previously with uh, the relationship between bone volume fraction uh, and apparent density shown at the bottom. What we found is that in our normal cohort, we had uh, a power law relationship with an exponent uh, two. So it's typical that in trabecular bone, the exponent is generally between two or three. This would be historical if you think back to that review article with density modulus relationships. But what we found in our OA cohort was a much more linear equation. And this, uh, this was, was different 
primarily at the larger bone volume fractions in these specimens, with the, the specimens with higher bone volume fraction having lower apparent modulus. So what I concluded from this study was that trabecular bone volume fraction and thickness are significantly increased in the subchondral trabecular regions of the OA bone within the humeral head. And when we use microfinite element models to derive our apparent mechanical properties of this OA bone, it differs between the OA and normal cohorts. And as I said, this is primarily at larger bone volume fractions. So John wanted to look at more of the experimental comparisons of these bones. So in that previous study that was purely computational and, and relied on microfinite element models. So John took six of these OA humeral heads that we had, very similar protocol to what we used in the hexapod robot previously. Uh, the humeral heads were, were potted and, and placed uh, under the loading platen. John developed a, a multi-pegged indenture here, which was able to apply loads in different positions on that osteotomized surface. And then exactly the same 500 Newton load, taking a preloaded and a postloaded scan. And again, we use bone DVC and Enrico Delara was our collaborator on this. Uh, John wanted to compare QCT finite element models of these OA humeral heads uh, to the experimental DVC here. So the diagnostic clinical scans, so these preoperative scans from these patients were used to derive the QCT finite element models. Exactly the same workflow that we showed in, in this, that I showed in the scapula before. They were meshed with quad elements, uh, material mapping properties from the literature and two different boundary conditions in this case. So the first on the top being DVC driven boundary conditions. So on that cut surface, we're driving all of the nodes using uh, DVC. And then there's this uh, curved articular surface in, in the interpolated DVC displacements were, were uh, applied on that surface as well. With the force driven boundary conditions, this is similar to that hybrid case I talked about before. On the articular surface, the curved surface DVC driven boundary conditions were used. Here, John modeled the, the indenter and then tied the surface uh, of this indenter to the, to the bone and then applied the experiment, experimentally measured force. As far as the uh, strain comparisons here, uh, the indenter had seven peg positions. So this is represented essentially as a clock face uh, with uh, a single center location. And then we also wanted to look at five equal depth regions. So we ignored the first half a millimeter because this is a cut surface and generally the strains are exaggerated at that surface. And then one millimeter um, regions, five of them below uh, each one of the indenters. Here, what we're looking at are just our experimental results. So these are experimental DVC strains by peg position. And this is for the first depth, reds being being our first principal strain, so our tensile strains, in blue being our third principal strains or compressive strains. On the x-axis, what we have here are our peg positions, which we can see in the figure, and then micro strain is on the y-axis. So what we found here was that peg position did not produce a statistically significant effect for both first and third principal strains. Similarly, what we're looking at here are experimental DVC strains by peg depth. We have our depths one through five on the x-axis and micro strain on the y-axis. In here, peg depth was found to produce a statistically significant effect for third principal strain, but not first principal strain. And that's pretty intuitive. I mean, we're applying our load on this cut surface up here, this resection surface. So we would expect our strains to be highest there. And we can see that in this color map as well. If we're comparing the experimental DVC strain results to the QCT strains, so we have a similar plot here with our experimental third principal strains on the x-axis and our FEM predicted strains on the y-axis. And here we have a Bland-Altman plot, which uh, shows uh, the results for both our force-driven and DVC-driven. So DVC-driven being black, force-driven being gray. What we found here was that DVC driven boundary conditions were found to better replicate the experimental results compared to the force driven boundary conditions. So similar to what we found before. Here we're looking at experimental versus QCT fine element model predicted strains by peg depth with third principal strain 
error being on the y-axis, the peg depth being on the x-axis, with the largest improvement of 14.5% strain in the FEM predicted, uh, which occurred uh, in depth one. So we can see less RMSE percent error in our DVC driven boundary conditions versus our force driven boundary conditions with the largest difference being in that first step. So what we conclude from this study is that experimental full field strains measured with DVC are influenced by peg depth, but not peg position in the OA humeral head. And that QCT fine element models of the osteoarthritic humeral head are able to replicate DVC measured strains when DVC driven boundary conditions are used. I then wanted, if we think back to that study that I did looking at the four different regions uh, in these OA humeral heads, I was curious if the changes that I had seen kind of in this region one or the subchondral trabecular bone region were due to modeling parameters that I had assumed or due to uh, some other factors basically that we hadn't uh, considered. So I thought that possibly that subchondral bone region uh, was had significantly different mineralization. We know that it has differences in trabecular thickness and we know that it has differences in bone volume fraction. But what is the effect of the tissue mineral density distribution? So what I did here was take a small core basically just from that region one, so the subchondral trabecular bone region, uh, applied heterogeneous materials. So here, instead of just assuming uh, a tissue modulus of 20 GPA, the tissue modulus varies uh, throughout the structure. I wanted to look at nonlinear uh, effects, or at least uh, enough so in order to determine a 0.2% offset. So I applied that to the finite element models, applied a larger strain up to 2% so that we could determine that 0.2% yield offset. Uh, and then I also wanted to look at tissue and bone mineral density variations uh, at 20 micron and 40 micron. And that's what we're, we see here. So we have uh, two matched bone volume fractions here, a 0.3 and a 0.47. On the left, what we have the left four, we have OA, and on uh, the right four, we have normal specimen uh, at 20 microns or 40 microns. And this is the tissue mineral density distribution in these specimens. So what we can see is that basically just on this very top or articular surface of the bone, do we really see the most mineralization uh, differences? And really, how does that persist throughout? And we can measure that with our mechanical properties. So that's what I did. And fairly uninterestingly, there was no difference between our normal or our OA bones. So here what we have uh, are, is apparent yield strain on the y-axis with bone volume fraction on the x-axis, black being normal and uh, gray being OA. And then in this plot, we have apparent yield stress by bone volume fraction. There was no significant difference between either, uh, either apparent yield strain or apparent yield stress in these microfine element models. So what I concluded here was that when accounting for material heterogeneity in microfine element models, there is no difference in the apparent yield strain or stress between the OA and normal subchondral trabecular bone in the humeral head. And this is important for QCT fine element models because it means we can use things like the density modulus relationship that's been defined for normal bone in OA bone. But we still weren't really able to validate these models. And because most models use a homogeneous tissue, tissue, model, <laughs> tissue mineral density and distribution, how do we uh, actually validate this? Well, this was nice because uh, kind of in parallel to me doing this computational study, John had started to develop a protocol to test these small trabecular cores. So here John is looking at these exact same humeral osteotomies, but using a bone saw to, smut, to cut small cores out of each humeral head. Uh, you can see here they're, they're potted with PMMA bone cement on the top and bottom. So he gets uh, nice flat surfaces. And this is really the uh, hexapod loading robot that kind of drove it all. This was the original one that Dr. Ferreira's students had been working on, uh, this small hexapod robot. And it really worked out nicely because we were able to then modify this setup to measure these small cores. And why we had to use this robot as opposed to the other was because our, uh, our voxel size is really dependent on how close we can get the specimen to the source. So in this case, we can get the source 
much closer because all of our loading just occurs in this very small um, chamber here. So we were able to, to image these cores at under five microns. And this is important because it improves our displacement field accuracy and precision, and then therefore improves our uh, strain field uh, accuracy and precision and gives us more trabecular level uh, strains that we can measure. So John's looking at this as a stepwise mechanical loading uh, setup. So here is that hexapod loading robot with, with the core being in this chamber up against the CT source. And he wants to look at stepwise. So the nice thing about DVC is that we get discrete time points. The ch challenge really is that we don't get any kind of effective strain rate. So we can take discrete times, but because we can do this stepwise, we can look all the way up to fracture. And then we can also do a post-fracture scan, which is what was done in this study. So typically we look at a preloaded scan first. So there's some small preload that's applied here uh, just to stabilize the core, allow that uh, the, the specimen to settle and take a first image. In this case, these were all uh, load driven. So then a, a 50 Newton force is applied. This stabilizes and then a second image is taken. Then 100 Newtons is applied, stabilized and then take that image. 125 newtons, 150 newtons, and then finally post fracture. So this is essentially a, a setup in order to determine when fracture is going to occur in these small trabecular cores. But the nice thing with this is I now had an experimental measure uh, with a very similar core that I could use for validation of the microfine element models. So because we have DVC driven di displacements on the top and bottom of each of these cores now, I can use this to essentially validate the models in the workflow that I developed in that previous model. So we'll be able to determine if some of the results that we were seeing there uh, are due to, again, some of the modeling assumptions that we make or due to um, actually something that we're seeing uh, experimentally. This is basically just a summary of John's stepwise mechanical loading, again, with the pre and post loaded scan. This just shows a 2D overlay of uh, the reference image or the preloaded image in gray with the loaded image in green. And here John's using a different DVC software. So this is Davis. This uses a local approach. And essentially it's using sub volume analysis in order to look at uh, displacement field and then a strain field. Again, we're still able to use this to validate finite element models because we still get full field displacements and strains. What John wanted to look at here were apparent level properties and local or trabecular level properties. So the first one being here, apparent strength. So here he's looking at the force at failure and using that to determine a stress as the force over the apparent area. Very similar to what I'm using in the validation for the finite element models. Here, DVC displacements on the top and bottom surfaces in order to determine an apparent strain. At the local or trabecular level, there's two different strain measurement resolutions. So typically as you increase your uh, strain measurement resolution, you, uh, you improve the accuracy and precision, but then you essentially smooth out your displacement, displacement field, which smooths out your strain field and you may not capture some of those physiological strains that are actually occurring. Uh, we also want to look at um, the local strain prior to failure. So John used a technique from the literature to quantify where the fracture zones were actually occurring in his, in his uh, post-fracture scan. And statistical analysis in this case was linear regression between the morphometric parameters and these outcome variables. So if we look at the apparent level results first, what we have here along the x-axis, bone volume fraction, trabecular thickness, and trabecular separation. On the top row is the apparent strength, so using that force at failure, and on the bottom is the apparent strain, using those DVC displacements. What we can see is that for apparent strength, we have a pretty good relationship uh, between bone volume fraction and apparent strength. But for apparent strain, there is not a very good relationship between apparent strain or bone volume fraction. Similarly, for trabecular thickness, strong relationship between apparent strength and trabecular thickness, but not so much for apparent strain. And similarly, 
trabecular separation, we didn't have as good of a relationship here, but higher than our, our apparent strain. So these are apparent level results. And then if we look at the local or trabecular strain results, again, we have our bone volume fraction, trabecular thickness, and trabecular uh, separation along the x-axis. Here on the y-axis is our micro strain. So this is measured with DVC. Purple uh, circles represent our strain resolution at the higher strain resolution, and gray represents the lower strain resolution. And you can see that basically we don't have a good relationship at high or low strain resolution uh, between our morphometric parameters and our uh, strain results. So what we conclude from this study is that trabecular morphometric parameters are strong predictors of apparent strength, which is consistent with the literature. And then the large microstrains were observed prior to macroscopic failure, but these were not correlated with any of the morphometric parameters. So just nearing the end here, I just wanna talk a little bit about practical applications of DVC or finite element model generation. I'm looking specifically here at the glenoid implant bone interface. So as I was finishing up at Western, this was a, a body of work that we had uh, accepted as a CIHR project grant, or sorry, as a CIHR catalyst grant. And what we're looking at here is a cadaveric specimen, which has a glenoid implant uh, that has been placed. And then we're looking at the exact same setup where we apply a load to this glenoid implant and we can see it essentially what's happening in the underlying bone as, as well as the interface between uh, the implant and the bone. And these implants are often cemented into the bone. So we can also look at uh, essentially the interface of the cement and the implant or the cement and the bone. And here what we can see is a map of full field strains uh, below the implant. This is just another representation. So this is a, a 3D rendering of that same specimen with an axial uh, slice. So this one has been has an applied load. What we can see in the, the axial slice of the glenoid here is the healed implant cavity. This represents the bone cement around here. These are gaps that exist uh, around the bone cement, which is interesting in itself. Uh, we can see the trabecular bone, and then we can see the cortical bone. And really what we get under, if we apply different boundary conditions is, is uh, displacement maps, which we can then use as strain or differentiate into strain maps to determine areas of high strain and potential damage. So there's high risk of failure happening uh, possibly in these regions right at uh, kind of the bone cement interface. Uh, as I mentioned before, the challenge with DVC is that you get static time points. Um, so really you can only apply a static load, do your scan, apply kind of stepwise loading. But we wanted to look at the effect of more, let's say cyclic protocols on what's happening with these implants. So this is part of our grant and part of a setup here where we have uh, attached to our hexapod robot and this whole thing can then go back into the micro CT scanner is a horizontal piston and a vertical piston, which has been uh, aligned with a linear thrust bearing. Uh, we then have a loading platen and a specimen with a, a glenoid component. So we could do a full cyclic loading protocol. We can then do our DVC scan. We can then add more cycles, do another DVC scan, and we can start to see what's happening as we run maybe a full cyclic loading protocol through some estimated uh, amount of arm motion. And this is really interesting and we're, we're looking forward to what comes from, from some of the work with this setup. And I just finally want to, to close with some concluding thoughts on OA bone and some of the observations that I made throughout my research. And what we have here on the top is, is a cadaveric scan of a, a shoulder. And this is typically what we'd like to see, a nice round humeral head with a nice glenoid and, and the bone quality looks good. But if we look at a patient scan uh, here with an axial uh, slice through the humeral head and glenoid, typically what we see are large osteophytes, large subchondral cysts, subchondral bone thickening. And these all affect things like how the implant sits on the bone and, and can affect the underlying bone. And similarly, if we look at a humeral head, so A here would be a normal uh, humeral head with very little, if any, uh, progression of, of OA. But by the time we look at the progression from B, C, D, and E, we can see that these very large cysts at this point persist all the way down to the osteotomized surface. 
So you can imagine that if we're using something like a stemless humeral component, which is supposed to lie on this bottom surface of the bone, and this cystic bone has actually persisted right into that, is there really any bone that can support that implant? So these are really the considerations and a lot of the motivations I think moving forward are to start to look at what's happening at these interfaces between implant, cement, and bone. So this has definitely been a collaborative project. Uh, a lot of this work was driven by uh, ideas that started in the clinic and then uh, really were um, executed by John and in, in a lot of the, the robotic uh, expertise came from Dr. Ferreira and multiple funding sources and other members of the lab throughout the years that I was there. So I'd like to thank everybody uh, at the Hulk Surgical Mechatronics Lab, everybody at Western, all my funding sources. And thanks everybody for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Nick, for um, the interesting talk. Um, before we get to the discussion period started, I would like to suggest and kind, kindly encourage you to turn on your camera during the discussion period if you are um, comfortable with it. Thank you very much. Um, so if you have any questions for Nick, please use the icon raise hand button, which can be found if you go click reaction icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You will see the long and long button in addition to like multiple icons there. If you cannot find the button under the reaction icon, then please go click participants icon at the bottom of your screen and you will see the blue icon labeled as raise hand at the bottom on the right hand side. Also, if you cannot find it anywhere, then please also feel free to quickly send me a message via Zoom chat, then I'll call on you when it is your turn. Now I'll open the seminar to the question. Yes, if us, please go ahead. Hey Nick, can you hear me? Hey Fos, yes. Yeah, so I have a bunch of questions, but I'll, I'll ask maybe like one and then let other people ask questions and maybe come back. But um, the first one I had was, I thought it was really interesting how you found that there was relationships between kind of standard parameters and stress, but not strain. And have you thought about why that might be, like what that might be indicative of? And yes, I'll, I'll kind of let you answer that part of it first. <laughs> yeah, so you're referring to the, the plots that I showed? Yeah just previously here, eh? Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's a challenge. I think with the measurement resolution, we're smoothing our strain field. Oh, okay. So I'm not sure if we're necessarily seeing uh, a lot in the strain. I think if we ended up with something like uh, synchrotron imaging, where we can start with a, a lower voxel size, like we're, we're scanning at five microns here and we're hoping to get strains at a single uh, bone structural unit but really we're not, we're kind of combining multiple bone structural units. So I'm not sure if we're really capturing uh, strains at that level here. And even in the apparent level that appears to not, to not show up. So I think it's fairly consistent with the literature that we see differences in the strength and not so much in the strain. Cool, because I was thinking about this and I thought that especially with like this kind of loading condition, I bet your answer is um, your stress answers are probably not affected by your density modulus relationship or your, or your Young's modulus very much at all, but your strains definitely are. And I was wondering if you explored, um, you know, does that mean that you need a more, that you get a better answer with a subject specific density modulus relationship or if you explored that as a potential cause of error? Yeah, so we haven't, so these are actually just experimental results. Um, that's kind of what I'm looking at. I haven't, Oh, those are, DV, those are DVC measures, not, not even a finite element. Exactly, yeah. So we're accounting for right. what distribution occurs here, but you're correct. I mean, that's the whole point of me valid, trying to use this to validate um, my microfine element models, right? So um, as I dig more into that and look at the strains, we'll see if we can see those strain variations, but you're absolutely correct. If we're using a homogeneous modulus with a microfine element model, I don't think we're going to see a lot of variation in the strain field, but I think we will if we look at heterogeneous. And then especially if we're looking at a QCT where we need um, uh, like a density modulus relationship, it's going to change the strain field. Awesome. Thank you. Would there be any? Yes, Brent, please go ahead. 
Hi, Nick. Thanks for the talk. Um, I first, um, I find it unsurprising that the DBC driven boundary conditions are the most accurate models. Um, but it's also a little bit unsurprising to me um, that the that the DVC driven boundary conditions would be insensitive to the chosen constitutive equation because it's it's displacement driven. So um, so you you could have used the DVC data and differentiated and calculated strains and compared strains, right? I mean, you couldn't, the best thing to compare would have been the stresses, but you, you can't measure those. So um, did you think about trying to compare strains for, I guess I'm referring to the first project? Yeah, we actually did that by our, our third study. So oh. we, we first looked at the boundary conditions, then I looked at density modulus mapping, and then the third study was comparing the strains. And I agree, it, it doesn't change in um, with the DVC driven boundary conditions um, in the string field either, but it does if we use contact force boundary conditions, which it, which is interesting. I agree. If it's displacement controlled, then it definitely I don't think affects the displacement or, or the strain. Um, but it, as soon as we start looking at maybe larger volumes or very different density modulus relationships, I mean that's why there was a big variation between equation one and equation three, because there was a lot of difference in the mapping of properties there. So when we drive that with force, it really localized those strains. And then when we're doing DVC driven, it kind of smooths out that displacement field and the strains don't really kind of expand. If you look at the micro level, then I think that's really where the interesting things are occurring, but you need really, really, really high resolution scans to get something super meaningful out of that, so. Okay, and then that makes sense. Okay, and then the other question I have is, um, why do you need the DVC driven boundary conditions? Why, what's wrong with your contact model? What's wrong with the assumptions of, because it's a real simple loading scenario, you just, it's a circle thing and you're applying a displacement or a load. I don't know what it was, but it seems simple enough. So why is it so hard to model that, that contact with, you know, that cup in the, in the, in the joint? I mean, that's a good question. I don't know. And I think the nice thing with the DVC is that we end up with full field displacements and strains that we can compare to. Right. And that can tell us all kinds of things about fracture, as, as you guys know, and you guys research all the time about what's actually happening at the trabecular level, what's happening through the trabeculae. And these are all important for things like initiation of fracture, uh, failure location. Why is it so hard to model? I mean, I don't think it's hard to model a simple boundary condition, but I think contact, which is often done when you're looking at something like a glenoid component because you want to look at the humeral component on the glenoid component, right? And that's a, a circular mismatched surface. The contact model is actually really, really hard to model properly. So if we're looking at something like a potted top surface and a potted bottom surface with just an axial load condition, sure, let's just do a simplified boundary condition like force or displacement driven, right? It's not too tough. But as soon as we're looking at something that would have to take into account um, contact, I think that, that's really where the challenge is and where DVC driven boundary conditions really, really drive that. Okay. And then the other question is, they're all sort of along the same line, same experiment when you, cause I've never done a DVC calibration experiment, uh, just strain gauge experiments where I maybe for a given bone might have six data points to work with. You now have however many data points as pixels. So how do you deal with the issue of, you know, you, you have one bone and you could have a thousand pixels. I assume you don't put all individual, uh, sorry, voxels. I assume you don't put all, every voxel displacement or strain value into your regression or, or do you do that? Uh, yeah, so it depends whether you're using a local approach or whether you're using a global approach. In the global, you put them all in. So 
Typically, the way uh, precision and accuracy are determined are, are uh, using uh, what we call like a zero strain condition. So you take two pre uh, preloaded images, so you wouldn't have any load applied, and you would compare those. So ideally, your displacements and your strain should be zero, but it's not, and it's due to some amount of imaging noise. And so your displacements have some precision and, and accuracy, and then your strains have essentially some worse precision and accuracy. You can also do artificial displacements. You could artificially or digitally displace each one of those voxels. And then you would know what your strains are and what your displacement field is, but you artificially don't have the same image um, noise. So kind of what is the standard, and I don't agree it's the best, especially for strain accuracy and precision, is the zero strain to unloaded images. Um, it's really a trade-off. I mean, it, I think there's still an active amount of research and now as DVC starts to be used in um, kind of the material testing world, a lot of people are looking at how can we accurately determine what our strain accuracy and precision is, because that's really where it matters. You know, and I think now people are starting to look at in vivo cases and using high field MRI, but the last study I read still had strain accuracy of something or un strain uncertainties of almost 3000 micro strain. Well, I mean, in bone, if we had uncertainties of 3000 micro strain, we wouldn't be able to use that measure. So it's still, quite a challenge, I think, to make sure what we're getting is exactly what we want. What I was really thinking about when I asked that question was the sheer number of data points that you have for a given specimen. And I worry that if you, you know, if I, I this would happen to me, I would submit this to a journal, I would do that. And then some person with statistics background would say, you're violating all of the assumptions of linear regression because all of these data points are not what do they have to be unrelated or uh, independent? They're not independent samples, right? What happens at one element dictates what happens to the neighboring element and these types of things. So is no one ever really concerned about, you know, that having so many data points in the regression that are theoretically dependent upon one another? I think that drives a lot of it. And I think there's been a few good uh, review articles. I wouldn't say that I'm the expert on how that actually occurs. And that's one of the reasons why we actually brought on Enrico as a collaborator, because he's the one who developed that. And I know they've done multiple studies looking at kind of how to optimize the precision and accuracy of bone DVC and Davis subvolume. Davis would be the most common commercially available. Um, I don't know, I, I agree. I mean, that was always my thought. And that's the same as if we take a micro fine element model and we're comparing it to uh, a DVC result with a, a million data points that we can yeah. compare. Of course, it's going to look good, right? But I think uh, I think there are ways that that that's been addressed, and I still think it's a challenge. I'm definitely not a stats expert as well, so I always challenge, I always get challenged with those questions. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, with therapy, uh, yeah, if us play, please go ahead. Sure. Um, uh, my second question follows up really nicely from what uh, Brent asked, which was. Um, I was wondering if you'd looked at, so I, I assume that like your DVCs are like subject specific, right? Like you look at exactly the displacements that happen to that one thing and then you apply it to that exact thing. Um, have you looked at, is it possible to use some of that data to generalize, like can that data be generalized so that you could apply something realistic without having to, you know, cut a human apart and uh, you know, put them into a machine. <laughs> and I guess the second part of the follow-up that Brent inspired me is, if that's possible, then what are we missing in our contact model that we can't do it from that? Like, if there's a pattern across all of them, then how come our contact models don't pick up the pattern? Absolutely. I mean, you, you brought me back to kind of a conversation we had when we first started doing it, and what is the relationship essentially between our, let's say, contact force boundary condition and our DVC boundary conditions. And can we use that? I don't think we ever really explored that. And I think that would really be the goal because still the, the problem is always, well, yes, you need to either do this in vitro or you need to do it, find some way to do it in vivo with measurements that work. And that's nice in the lab setting, but how can we actually apply it? Because we can say DVC driven boundary conditions improve all accuracy. Yes, but we're not going to do that in every case. And every lab doesn't have the availability of scanning 
uh, a bone in a micro CT. You know, it's a lot of work and, uh, you know, it just isn't feasible. So I think that would be the most interesting is let's try to come up with maybe a simplified contact model that can replicate DVC boundary conditions or at least know the relationship between them, right? Yeah, or even just some sort of like shape, like even like go, not even as mechanistic, like some sort of, if the overall pattern of stress distribution seems to follow some sort of scaling law, can you sort of use that to figure out what the stress distribution should be like on an arbitrary, or estimate what the stress distribution should be like on an arbitrary uh, scapula bone? Absolutely. Yeah. But of course, if you have tons of like just individual, like weird things happening that, that defy any sort of general pattern, then maybe that doesn't work. But I don't know if you saw that or not, or if they all kind of look like little circles at a spot. Uh, no, it's pretty dependent. Um, and even though the loading condition is fairly simple, the geometry of a glenoid is not, or a scapula is not, so it bends quite a bit. So the displacement fields are quite subject specific, which maybe even further complicate what we're trying to just discuss there, so. Cool, thank you. Yes, please, Sarah, go ahead. Hey, Nick, thank you very much. It was an excellent talk, and you actually sort of answered many of my questions as you went along, so it was nice to see that, that building upon stuff. But I wanted to go back to the question about tissue quality in OA bone, and, and perhaps I sort of missed, it was, was it your third to last and last experiment, sort of the link there. But I think in, in the third to last, you found that um, the tissue modulus relationship didn't really explain as much in the OA bone. Am I correct on that? That's correct. And, and so that, I, I guess that makes some sense to me if we're talking about bone volume fraction, because probably the, the actual bone quality of that bone, although there's more of it, isn't as good. But then how does that relate to your findings in your last project? And that was where I, I lost the link there. And I just wonder if you can explain that a little bit better. Yeah, so I think it doesn't necessarily really affect the um, apparent results. And I think that's not really that surprising from what we're seeing in the literature. So if we're looking at the slide that I have up right now, this is these are the experimental results that John did. And these are just the apparent comparisons. He didn't actually find relationships between the morphometric parameters on this next slide in, in the strains. And I think this is really probably where it's more interesting to explore. And I think if you look at the people who are kind of driving DVC research, Enrico De Lara, and there's uh, Gianluca Tazi at, uh, in the UK as well, in uh, Hannah Isaacson in London University, is they're trying to use synchrotron radiation in order to get kind of that basic uh, structural unit so that they can get tissue level strains. Because I think that's where everything is happening. But what we're seeing is that at the apparent level, bone volume fraction is dictating like 90 or more percent of the mechanical properties with those variations in trabecular thickness only dictating maybe that final 10% and probably not even just something so mechanistic like trabecular thickness or something that we think of. Um, so if we wanna look at like a tissue level strain on almost like a single trabeculate level, that's a difficult thing to do, um, either with a microfine element model or with a experimental setup, right? And I think that's probably where a lot of it's being driven, but we're kind of just washing out our strain field here at different strain resolutions, and maybe we're not getting that great precision or accuracy, even in our displacement field, even being able to scan these at five microns, which we thought would kind of answer those questions, but maybe even our image noise is too high here. So maybe it's even just a parametric study of looking at some better imaging parameters. Um, maybe it's the software, we used a different software in this one too, so. Um, we have just, we, you and I should chat later. Roman Krawitz and I did get a device that's supposed to go inside the X-Radia um, as part of a recent CFI. So the resolution there isn't a ton better than at least on our scan systems like by voxel size, but I'd say the image quality, like the SNR seems to be far higher. Um, so anyways, something to talk about in the future because I didn't realize you had done all this other work, which is fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, looking forward to it. Okay, I see Walter, if you have any question for Nick. Yeah, Nick, thank, thanks for the talk. And uh, since you got all the questions from the bone people, now you get questions from somebody who doesn't know anything about bone. <laughs> Um, 
I, I was intrigued by that you found these different structural parameters between the OA bone and the normal bone, but then the material properties were about the same. And the one thing that I was wondering when you then did the failure testing, did the failure in the OA and the normal joints um, occur at the same force, at the same strain, or was there a difference there? Yeah, I don't think I have those results here. So this one, this is a study John's just writing up now. So hopefully we'll see the results shortly. I don't know that, but he said there was a lot of variation in the specimens that he tested here as far as what the failure load was. So even though they were loaded at 50, 100, 125, 150, and then a post fracture, some of them didn't make it to that even 125 or 150. And I'm not sure if that was, I'm not sure actually if John compared OA normal bone here. I'm pretty sure this study for his stepwise loading was only in the OA bone. So it would be interesting to include samples from the normal, uh, the normal specimens as well. The other thing that I was wondering is, um, uh, you know, in terms of the applications, because you work with the shoulder joint and, you know, people are worried in the knee and the hip that the implants hold and the bone doesn't break and so but I would have thought that's, that that might not really be a, a problem in the shoulder. Is it a, is it a problem in the shoulder? This, you know, presumably much le less loading than let's say at a hip, hip or a knee? Yeah, I think there are a few things. I think what's interesting with the shoulder and something I didn't really realize until I started is you can have over one times body weight force just through your glenohumeral joint, just due to muscle forces, intrinsic muscle forces. And I think what's interesting about that is Essentially, we think of it as a ball and socket, but it's not. It's an unconformed socket. So the glenoid radius of curvature is actually quite a bit bigger than the humeral head. So there are small translations that occur in that surface. And when we look at something like an implant, I never really realized until I started doing the research is how small a glenoid, a plant, polyethylene glenoid component actually is. It's probably only one inch by one inch in the kind of uh, circumference. And that's a very small implant to put into a joint that's having something like up to, well, it can even have two times body weight if you were, if you were lifting a weight out in abduction. So that's a lot of, a, a lot of, uh, of force. And I think what we see often are the glenoid component fails super early in patients. And I actually did a review article at the end of my PhD, which found that glenoid component, so the, the shoulder component of your total shoulder orthoplasty is actually only lasting between four and five years. And that's pretty concerning. P patients are having surgery at around 60, 65 or 70, and then they need a replacement within four years. And there's almost no bone stock left by the time you get to that first or even second revision surgery. Yeah. And the patients are still quite young. So I think there's a lot of work where this can be applied, as you mentioned, in trying to improve glenoid component design or just implant design in general. The other questions that I had, you know, uh, it's really interesting, you know, that you can do this loaded to micro CT. Can you do that in Calgary as well? Or is that very specific to what you could do um, in, in London or, or can you? No, I think that's actually what uh, Sarah was just mention mentioning is okay. you kind of need a, a a scanner that has a larger, it needs to be essentially a cone beam scanner that has a, a fixed source and a fixed um, detector so that you end up, in this case, we used a metrology scanner, which had a nice big uh, uh, stage that we could rotate. So we were able to move this stage. It also had, I think, a 50 kilogram capacity. So you could put a very large robot on there and actually do that. Here we have the x radius scanner where it kind of works the same way. Um, I've seen people do it in the Scanco can scanners, um, but the problem with that is essentially you end up with stacks of images. So you kind of have to sequentially take images. And when you're doing that under something that's load, if you end up with any kind of motion in between those stacks, it really throws off your displacement field and then really throws off your strain measurements. And those studies have really had a challenge. I've reviewed a few of those and they really have a challenge Kind of getting through the uh, the review process because of those uh, those limitations. And just a last question and one a one sentence answer. When Song Wan introduced you, she said that you were working as a research assistant in anthropology. Mm -hmm. What did you do there? <laughs> so the scanner I mentioned uh, was actually bought 
by through a CFI grant with uh, uh, a researcher at Western known as Dr. Andrew Nelson. And he is an archeologist um, and basically studies bone and mummies uh, across time scales essentially. Uh, and most of his research focuses on non-invasive methods. So in the archeology span field, usually you cut up bone samples mm -hmm. and scan them. But when you have a 10,000 or so old specimen, you don't always want to cut it up and do your analysis. So yeah, yeah. they bought this scanner so that they could scan all their specimens. And yeah. so I actually worked as the CT technician while I was at Western yeah. with the So system. you're going to have a couple of publications in anthropology journals. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. So there's a few other people at Western now who have kind of got on that, uh, that uh, train and, and we're looking at some studies for that too, so. Thanks a lot, thank you. Thank you. Would there be any last question for Nick? If not, I would like to thank Nick again for giving a great talk. Next week, we'll be hearing from Fabian Hoitz and he will be talking about individuality decoded by gates, movement characteristics that determine the uniqueness of human gates. Thank you everybody. Um, have a good rest of the day and I'll see you next week. Thanks.